We're going to have a look now at two Psalms, Psalm 31 and Psalm 109, which as you can see on the screen are actually Psalms of betrayal. Now no one likes being betrayed. It's one of the worst trials that you can confront. And it's very significant that on the, on the night, on the evening when the Lord brought his disciples together, he said uh, certain things to them, which indicated, of course, that one of them, one of them was a betrayer. And of course, we know who that was. It was Judas Iscariot. We're going to have a few words to say about Judas Iscariot in this study. But Paul records in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, words that are read very frequently uh, in our meetings. He said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, notice the words, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, this is the very day that he is going to be betrayed by Judas, that he takes bread and Judas is among them. The betrayer is among them. Betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss, he was to say later on. All right. So you see, brothers and sisters, that's a terrible trial, isn't it? And contemporary behaviour, of course, is, is the exact opposite to the behaviour of our Lord Jesus Christ. We live in what they call the age of rage and revenge. And they have, they have television programs like soap operas and other, other films called Revenge. You've you probably heard about them, haven't you? Revenge. It's all about getting even. Don't just get angry, they say. Get even. So go out and get your revenge. That's the age in which we live. So we have road rage and things like that. You know, if you happen to accidentally cut someone off on, on a highway, they're after you to try and get you back, stupidly. Everybody could die. All right? But that's the age we live in. The age of revenge. So labouring to save those who betray you is one of the most difficult of all trials. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ tried to do. He tried to turn... Judas around even though he was he knew that it wouldn't work and that Judas would betray him he did his best to turn him around he knew exactly that what would happen exactly what Judas's character was like he knew he would not succeed brothers and sisters but he still set out to try and turn Judas around that's the kind of spirit that we must have if we want to be followers of our Lord Jesus Christ some will betray us, some will dislike us, whatever it may be. We have to have that spirit of setting out to do our absolute best for those who might be in that position. Psalms of betrayal. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 16 we read this. This scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas. So what did the mouth of the Holy Spirit, speak about Judas. Well, Acts chapter 1 and verse 20 says this, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. Now what you can see there in the yellow on the screen comes from Psalm 69 and verse 25. But not the balance of the verse. What you there see in blue and his bishopric, let another take, comes from Psalm 109 and verse 8. So two psalms are brought together in Acts chapter 1, when Luke records what happened, brought together to demonstrate that the scripture spoke eloquently, and particularly the psalms spoke about Judas, his character and his betrayal of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was all typed, of course, in what Ahithophel did to David. So let's have a look, a very quick look at the, a profile of the betrayer. So when choosing Judas, Christ knew a lot about him already. In Psalm 41 verse 9 we read the words about Ahithophel that David wrote. Mine own familiar friend in whom I trust. In John chapter 12 verses 4 to 6 you'll find that Judas was actually positioned close to Christ. When they were in a room, Judas wasn't that far away. In fact you remember he handed him a sop. So he wasn't that far away. Now there were 12 of them you can't all be up close. Judas was there. Why was Judas there? Well, he had the bag. He'd been given responsibilities. He was clearly a friend of Christ. He was clearly one that Christ relied upon to get arrangements in place. So he sent him out to organise things. And, you know, he had the bag. He, had the, he was the treasurer. So he sent him out with the money to buy this and that. He relied upon him. But he knew he was, he knew he was a betrayer. He knew, in fact, that he was actually stealing out of the bag. Isn't that incredible? 
that he could have the attitude that he did towards Judas when he knew that was happening? Would you let that happen? You see, he wanted to turn that man around. That was the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 55, verses 12 to 14. It was not an enemy that betrayed him, he says in Psalm 54. David is is writing that psalm. Not an enemy, but an advisor and a close acquaintance. That's why Judas wasn't far away from leaning on Jesus' breast, says the record of John 13 and verse 26. Now, Psalm 109. This is the other psalm we're going to use briefly here uh, in this third study. Come to Psalm 109 with me. I'm going to put something in Psalm 31 because we'll be back there shortly. Psalm 109 is all about Judas Iscariot. Now, many of you will be quite familiar with this, but it won't hurt just to cover this ground again. Psalm 109, verses 3 to 5, we read this. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. Now, who's writing this psalm? Well, if you have a look at the superscription, you'll see it says, to the chief musician, those words belong to Psalm 108. They're the subscription of Psalm 108. And then what you have is the superscription of Psalm 109, the words, a psalm of David. So it's David who's writing this psalm. Verse 4, For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. Verse 5, And they have rewarded me evil for good, and hatred for my love. Now, the relationship between Ahithophel and David was very strong. They walked together in the house of God. Their minds were attuned, very spiritually attuned together. They had a wonderful companionship in the faith. The problem was that Bathsheba was the granddaughter of Ahithophel. And so when David corrupted, he he corrupted Bathsheba and destroyed her marriage, all right, When David got involved, this brought disgrace upon the family of Ahithophel. You know, it lowered his his dignity in the nation, his status in the nation, that his granddaughter should be corrupted by his best friend, the king. And so he set out to get revenge. And so when the time came, when David was sick and Absalom rose up, he said, right, now my time has come. He's going to get revenge against David. So David's love for him uh, was rewarded with evil. And so it was with Christ and Judas. His love for Judas was rewarded with hatred, brothers and sisters. So what was Christ's antidote? Or what was David's antidote? Look at verse 4. For my love they are my adversaries, but I... Now the words in italics, give myself unto, are not there in the text. You could just read it this way. But I pray. I pray. That was his answer. All right. His enemy was his best friend, one of his good friends. But I handle that. I pray. He had a relationship with his God that enabled him to see through, to see through to the end of betrayal. And so John 6 verse 7, he records those words about Judas that Christ said, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a diabolos? The flesh is in control. So what about Psalm 109 verse 9? What does that tell us? Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Well it tells us that Judas was a married man and he was a father of children. Alright? Verse 11 goes on to say this. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath and let the strangers spoil his labour. So in other words he had something to be stolen. Judas was a man, a man of some means. In fact, we know he was very interested in real estate. Because in Acts chapter 1, verse 18, with the money that he had got from the priest, he went out and bought a field. You know, he, he was interested in real estate. So that's why he was pinching from the bag. So the funds that were given to Christ and the disciples, his apostles, as they, as they went about the ministry, he was pilfering some of that, putting it into a fund to buy real estate. All right? Christ knew that. He he knew it from Psalm 109. Verses 16 to 18, we read this. Because that he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. And as he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. Now, what's he talking about? You know, he, he is telling us, brothers and sisters, that Christ knew 
But in the privacy of his own little presence, Judas was cursing inwardly. He was amongst Christ and the disciples during the day, but when it came time for him to be alone, he was saying, oh, God. he was cursing inwardly. And of course it ended up betraying him to the priests. Verse 18, as he clothed himself with cursing like as with his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. So Judas was prefigured by Hithophel. Just like Ahithophel cursed David because he'd besmirched his name, so Judas found reason to curse our Lord Jesus Christ inwardly. That, brothers and sisters, is a profile of Judas the betrayer. That's all I'm going to say about Psalm 109. I want you to come back to Psalm 31 now because this is the, the psalm that's going to dominate the rest of our session here this afternoon. <coughs> psalm 31 is a psalm of David. That's what the heading will tell you. The words to the chief musician uh, actually belong to Psalm 30, but the words of Psalm of David are the superscription of the psalm. It was written by David on a, on a, on a special occasion, an occasion of his betrayal. By people he came to save. So this is why it's so important to our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 31 is a desperate but trusting prayer for deliverance from the hands of betrayers. In verses 1 to 8, there's a plea for help to God who can save and a rejoicing at his deliverance. In verses 9 to 13, the psalmist's pitiful situation emphasises his need. In verses 14 to 18, his trust urges the psalmist to further cries for help from his God. In verses 19 to 22, there is the praise of the goodness of God towards those that fear him. And then those wonderful words that conclude the psalm, verses 23 and 24, which are an exhortation to all of God's saints to trust in him. So the lessons that can be learned from David's life and his experience and from what this meant to our Lord Jesus Christ need to be learned by us, brothers and sisters. That's why those two verses that end the psalm are there. So let's see if we can dig down a little bit into the background of this psalm. Now it's clearly messianic, isn't it? It's clearly messianic because here are the seven sayings of our Lord on the cross. And there were seven. Father, forgive them. Number one. The, the promise he made to the thief, which we've just read, by the way, in our readings in Luke 23. Uh, he provides for his mother. He puts his mother into the arms of John. The fourth, my God, my God, quoting Psalm 22 verse 1. I thirst, Psalm 69 verse 21 is number 5. The sixth saying on the cross, it is finished, drawn from Psalm 22 verse 31, which we'll consider God willing tomorrow. And the seventh saying on the cross, into thy hands I commit or commend my spirit. Now that's the one that comes from this psalm. That's Psalm 31 and verse 5. So have a look at Psalm 31 verse 5. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. The very final words from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ before he fell asleep, before he died on the cross. So what do you reckon might have been the words, the very first words that he spoke when the angels woke him up and took the the napkin from off his head. Now they left, they left the, 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 uh, the cloths around his body on because we read in John chapter 20 that when they took the napkin from his head, they rolled it up very neatly and they put it in a place by itself. We know this. It was all prefigured in Zechariah 3. They put it in a place by itself. It signified the source of his victory. What had gone on in his mind. See? He was the true Nazarite. And so they put him... So he, here he is, he's woken up, and they unwrap him. What do you reckon the first words comes out of his mouth? Well, I reckon I know. The balance of verse 5 of Psalm 31. The last words he spoke were, Into thine hand I commit my spirit. I think the first words he spoke, he finished the sentence. And the sentence goes... Thou hast redeemed me. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? Thou hast redeemed me. O oh, he who will become the power of truth. Wow. What 
a phrase for a man who's just woken up from sleep who's never going to go to sleep again. Never. He will never, ever sleep again because he was made immortal very shortly thereafter and walked out of that tomb an immortal man. What a wonderful way to begin immortality. Thou hast redeemed me, O he who will become the strength, the power of truth. We are so privileged, brothers and sisters, to be in the body of Christ, to be related to those things, to stand in hope of immortality, to be there with him in the day when all the world will know the God of truth who raised his son from the dead. This is a messianic psalm. And it's got a wonderful message for you and me. And its background is found in 1 Samuel chapter 23. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put something into Psalm 31 so that I can get back there. And I'm going to take you to the 1st of Samuel chapter 23. But before you do that, I've got one thing to point out to you and it's on the screen in front of you. We're going to go back and have a look at what happened at a place called Keilah in 1 Samuel 23. Keilah means citadel or a strong city. And that's a clear link with Psalm 31 verse 21 which says this. Blessed be the Lord for he has showed me his marvellous kindness in a strong city. Yeah, there's a clue. Keilah means a strong city or a citadel. So we're going to find that the background to Psalm 31 is back in 1 Samuel 23. You know, he says in this psalm, verse 22, he says these words. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. In mine haste, yes. And, and there was a hastening, wasn't there, when David had to escape from the city of Keilah. We're going to find that as the background of this psalm. In Psalm 31, verse 3, in this psalm, David writes, For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore by, for thy name's sake lead me and guide me. Yes, he claims Yahweh as his rock. And we're going to find, that's the word Selah, by the way, that when we get back to 1 Samuel 23, verse 28, we're going to read about a rock in the life of David called Selah, Hamalekoth. And we'll find out why that's important. And there are other themes drawn from 1 Samuel 23 through 26. The theme of the hand. So if you're going to come back with me, do that now. I'll come back to, to 1 Samuel chapter 23. And here's a little exercise. If you want to just start to, to open up 1 Samuel chapter 23 through 26, you can do a simple exercise. Go through and highlight the occurrences of the word hand. You'll be amazed at the number of times that it occurs in 1 Samuel 23 through to chapter 26. So that's something you can take away and if you wanted to do that, you will get some value out of that. The word hand is very, very prominent in this context of scripture. Now why would that be the case? Well, because you see Psalm 31 is all about a hand. Verse 15, my times are in thy hand. Verse 5, into thy hand I commit my spirit. Verse 8, in the, thou hast not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. Thou hast set my feet in a large room. So these, this theme of the hand is drawn from the context of 1 Samuel chapter 23 through chapter 26. And there's the theme of the times. In Psalm 31 and verse 15, Christ through David says, My times are in thy hand. And so we're going to find that theme also comes out. Okay, so in 1 Samuel 24 verse 4, David says to Saul, or at least he says of Saul, and the men of David said unto him, Behold the day which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thee, thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. David arose and he cut off the skirt of Paul's robe privily, but of course his heart smote him for that. Why? Oh, He'd set his hand against Yahweh's anointed and the time was not right. Saul's time was in God's hand. That's why he says, his day shall come. In 1 Samuel 26, 8, his time will come. Leave it in God's hands. So you get the idea? A lot of this stuff we read in Psalm 31 is actually lifted out of 1 Samuel 
23 through 26. But it's chapter 23 that we want to focus on. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm going to use this, this little map here of the southern portion of Judah. And we're going to follow through what happens. We don't have time to go through the history in great detail. We don't need to do that. We just need to know what was happening. And we're going to see how David was betrayed by people that he saved. So just come back to the first of Samuel 22, to verses 1 and 2. You read there, without reading all of the words in those two verses, just scan your eyes down that. In, in verse 1 it says, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave at Dullam. Now at Dullam is in the wilderness of Judah down here. Uh, in fact, it's very uh, difficult to get there today, you know, to go to the real cave of Adullam. It's not something that you can actually get to very... We look for it, and it's not easy. So there it is, cave of Adullam. Here, it was, it was a safe place to be. Uh, but it wasn't where God wanted David. He takes refuge there, but then in 1 Samuel 22, verse 5, he's told by the prophet Gad to leave the cave of Adullam, which was too safe. It was far too safe. Strange, isn't it? God wanted him where he could actually be chased by Saul, found by Saul, betrayed by people that were in, uh, in league with Saul. And verse 5 says, And the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold, that is in the cave of Adullam, depart and get thee into the land of Judah. So David departed and came into the forest of Harith. So he moves away from the cave of Adullam. Now, I'm sorry about this. This is America. Uh, and you don't use kilometres, do you? Um, but 20 kilometres is 12 miles. Okay, so get a bit of a feel for distances here. That's probably about three or four miles, um, you know, five-ish miles to the forest of Harith, where he moves. And now he's, he's in the, you might say, the body of Judah. This is where there are people to be found who can betray him, by the way. But then we read that the Philistines attack Keilah in this chapter. And so they, they make the life of the inhabitants of a town just to the south of Adullam, Keilah, very difficult. So what happens then? Well, there's Keilah. What happens then, of course, is that David saves Keilah. So let's pick the record up in, second, in, sorry, in 1 Samuel 23, and verses 1 through um, 5. 1 Samuel 23, verse 1 says, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they robbed the threshing floors. Now it's harvest season, obviously. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines, and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Hang on a minute. Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? So his men are not all that happy about the prospect of having to go to Keilah to be out in the open and to fight against the Philistines. So David goes back to God, verse 4. Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men went to Keilah, and they fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Now, put yourself, brothers and sisters, in that town. It's harvest time. This is your food for the next 12 months being prepared. Along come the Philistines. They want to take it all and probably put most of you to death in the process. So you're in strife. You are in big trouble. And along comes the beloved David with his men and saves you from the hand of the Philistines. Now, you are going to be so grateful. There is no way in the world that you'll ever betray your Saviour. Is there? Well, yeah, they do. Isn't that so typical of human beings? Isn't that so sad that people can betray their saviour. Well, Judas did, and others have done it ever since, and sadly will go on doing it. That's human nature. So, brothers and sisters, we can learn a lot out of this. The last thing we want to do on the eve of the return of Christ is to betray 
our Saviour. And it can be done. So what happens? Well, a betrayed David flees to the wilderness of Sif. Before I get there, we need to focus on what happens here. Verse 7. It was told Saul that David was come to Kelo, and Saul said, God hath delivered him into my hand. We're sure. And he, he talks about him being shut in, in, in a town with bars and gates. And he called the people together to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul was doing this and he practised mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar, who just turned up from the slaughter of Doeg, he says to him, bring hither the ephod. He's going to inquire of God. Verse 10, then, da- then said David, O Yahweh God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Then he asked, Look at this. I love this, brothers and sisters. This is the way God works in our life. So learn a lesson from this. Verse 11. David asks two questions. And God gives him an answer to one. Not the one he really wants an answer to. Look at it. He says, Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? That's question one. Then he asks question two. Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? And God replies, he will come down. He answers question number two. He does not answer question number one. So what do you do? Oh, you throw your hands in the air and say, well, God doesn't want to give me an answer, I won't worry anymore. Is that what you do? No. You do what David did. Look at verse 12. Then said David... Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hands of Saul? That's what he really wanted to know. So he asks again. And Yahweh said, yeah, they will deliver you up. And he finds it hard to believe. But that's what's going to happen. They will deliver thee up. So David goes for his life. Verse 13 onwards describes how he flees to the wood of Ziph. And in verse 14, David abode in the wilderness in in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him out of his hand. What does that teach us, brothers and sisters? I'll tell you what it teaches me. Persistence in prayer is absolutely essential in the latter days. You can ask God for help and guidance in the difficulties that you might face. Don't expect to get the answer you want today. <coughs> All right? Don't expect to get every answer. Nothing will be given to you on a platter. But keep asking. Because when God's time is right, <coughs> you'll get the answer. My times, said David in Psalm 31 verse 15, my times are in God's hands. He knows the perfect timing for everyone. He never gets his times wrong. We do. So you keep asking until the answer comes and it will come when he is ready. That's the lesson we learn from that. So here is David in the wilderness as if verse 15 says, And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. So what what happens next? Well, we know what happens. Jonathan comes down to strengthen his hand. Jonathan has no problem finding him, does he? He comes to strengthen his hand. Not an issue. He knows exactly where David is. Saul can't find him. Yeah, God's intervened. But the men of Ziph send messengers to Saul saying, we want to carry favour with the king. We might get some benefits from the king if we tell where David is. So they go to the king. And so Saul brings his army down. And we read that in in 1 Samuel 23. If you come along to verse 24 and 25 with me. And they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon. In the plain on the south of Jeshimon. Saul also and his men went to seek him. And they told David. Wherefore he came down into a rock. It, It should read the rock. You know what the word rock is there? Selah. He came down into the Selah, and we'll talk about the Selah in a minute, 
and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. So he, down he comes. So David's had to flee. He's had to flee from Keilah. He's come down into the wilderness or the wood of Ziph. The Ziphites betray him. And down comes Saul with his army. All right, And he flees to Maon, further to the south. So David's down here in Maon now. Well, what does Saul do? Well, of course, he pursues after him. And he surrounds David. Look at verse 26. He surrounds David and his men. And Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David on, and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. For Saul and his men compassed. The words literally mean they were surrounded. So Saul and his men were surrounding David and his men round about. Again, that's an indication that it's actually encompassing them. But all of a sudden, out of the blue, arrives a man saying, the Philistines have invaded the land. And Saul, have they? So he's got to divert and go somewhere else. This is how God works in our lives, brother. And the timing is perfect. It's always perfect. So what's our part? Just keep praying. Just keep asking. And when God is ready, he might take you to the very wire, but he will redeem you. He will redeem the faithful. That, brothers and sisters, is the lesson that we learn from this incident in the life of David. And he's going to memorialise this in a rock, the rock, the Selah. And we'll see what that means. So the Philistines invade the land... Saul then has to make his way up here to face the Philistines and David is saved at a place called Selah Hamalekoth. Just read on with me to verse 27 and 28. Verse 27. There came a messenger unto Saul saying, Haste thee and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore they called that place Selah Hamalekoth. And from thence he went up to the stronghold at En Gedi. So this, we'll talk about this Selah Hamalekoth. And then of course he goes up to, to the edge of the Dead Sea to En Gedi, which was another hold that David spent some time in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the wilderness of Judah. So what does it mean? Selah Hamalekoth consists of two Hebrew words. Selah, which means a lofty, craggy rock. In other words, not a small rock, not a, not a boulder, but a huge cliff. Right? That's a selah in biblical terms. Mahalak, mahaloket in Hebrew has the idea of sharing or division or allotment from the root halak, which has the idea of breaking into parts, hence dividing. And that's the idea of this name, Selah Hamalekoth. A literal translation would be the rock of the division. This is where God divided between David and his men who were surrounded by Saul. He divided them and sent Saul off somewhere else so that David was redeemed. And the key element of that is that God does the dividing. This is what David memorialised by calling that place Selah Hamalekoth. And that's why he says in Psalm 31... Thou art my Selah. You can rely upon this God, brothers and sisters. So I want you to come back now that we've got the background to Psalm 31. We see where it's all drawn from. We want to come back now to Psalm 31 and finish this off. So in Psalm 31, we're going to have a look at a few verses here. In verses 9 to 10, we read about the trouble that comes from wrestling with the tendencies of human nature. Psalm 31, verse 9. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eyes consume with grief, my soul and my belly. For my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. I was a reproach among my, my enemies, but especially among my neighbours, the ones he saved, the ones he set out to save. In Gilah, he, he became a reproach to them, and a reproach to the men of Ziph, a fear to mine acquaintance. They that did see me without fled from me. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. 
I'm like a broken vessel, for I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. That is how David felt, brothers and sisters. And that's exactly how our Lord Jesus Christ felt. It's exactly how he felt. Betrayed by a close friend. Betrayed by the leaders. Pursued by the leaders of the nation. Like Saul pursued David. That's exactly how he felt. He knew what was going to come across his path. He uses this word iniquity in, in, in this passage. But you'll see it there. The word iniquity. And that word means perversity. From the root avar. To be bent or crooked. And just like Saul was crooked. And those who betrayed David were crooked. So those who became the enemies of Christ were crooked. And of course nobody argues the fact that the bias of human nature towards sin is crooked. We've got a few problems. Many of us have got problems. All of us have got some kind of problems. Some of us have got serious problems. They come from human nature. Verses 11 to 13. He's treated as an enemy by friend and foe. He talks about neighbours and acquaintances. Men like Saul, the men of Kelar, the Ziphites and so on. He became a reproach. That, that word in the Hebrew, by the way, is used five times in Psalm 69, which we'll focus on tomorrow, God willing. So what about this subject of the times? We called this class, My Times Are In Thy Hand, quoting from verse 15 of Psalm 31. It's a fact, brothers and sisters, that from the Psalms and from other scriptures, Christ knew his whole life would be bound by divinely appointed times. And we know what is said about him. In Galatians 4 verse 4, he was born of a woman, born under the law. So there was a time to be born at a precise period in history. There was a time to preach the kingdom. He says to his disciples, my time is now to preach. And he, he went out to do that. There was a time for the last supper. The time has come. The hour has come, he said. In Matthew 26 verse 18. But there was a time for betrayal as well in John 7 verses 6 and 8 and 13 verse 21. And there was a time to die, John 16 and verse 32. But there was also a time for resurrection, Mark 9, 31. And there was a time for glory. Now think about that. His whole life was governed by divine times, all prearranged. Everything that happened, happened according to to God's timing. That, brothers and sisters, is a lesson for us, is it not? Because sometimes we wonder whether or not God is with us. Sometimes we ask and we don't think we receive. We have, we have actually received. The answer is not at present. Now is not the time. When the time comes, then you'll get your answer. And all of this, brothers and sisters, all of this can be endured if this is your state. Now Psalm 31 verse 20, and we're getting towards the end of this psalm, gives us a, a little clue into the, into the state of mind of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because this is the state of mind that David had. Verse 20. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence. Notice the language. The secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Now, this word secret, sether, means a hiding place. In fact, if you have a look over at Psalm 32, verse 7, this is what you read. Thou art my hiding place, says the psalmist. Yes, yeah, so God becomes a hiding place. The same idea as in Psalm 27, verse 5. So, we do have a hiding place. It's in the relationship that we have with our God. And that relationship can give security in a very unstable place. Do you see what it says here? It says, this, this hiding place is in the secret of thy presence. And it goes on to say, thou shalt keep them secretly by covering them over in a pavilion. Pavilion? The Hebrew word is sukkah, sukkoth. It's actually a reference to a booth or a hut. Now, we know from places like Isaiah, chapter 1, for example, that this is a very unstable place. I mean, when they put up booths in the Feast of Tabernacles, remember, they, they cut down branches and they stack them together. You ever seen what happens to them when the wind comes along? They're, they're fine in summertime when there's not much wind. But as soon as the wind and the storms come, they're blown over. 
This is one of the most unstable, temporary places on earth. What's the lesson? Well, the lesson is this. I want you to have a look with me at what it says uh, in uh, Psalm 27, verse 5, which you can see quoted at the base of that slide. Look at Psalm 27 and verse 5. Very, very similar language is used. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, his sock, his succoth, his booth, in the secret of his tabernacle, his ohel, his little round tent. Shall he hide me? He shall set me upon a rock. Now that word happens to be Zur, not Selah, but it's the same thing. Zur, of course, is talking about God. So get the picture, brothers and sisters and young people. Life, as one of our Prime Ministers in Australia said, wasn't meant to be easy. And it isn't. A lot of trials come along. It wasn't meant to be easy. We are exposed sometimes. We, we end up in a really temporary, shaky a, you know, set of affairs, whatever that might be. Family, plea, whatever. We're in a sh- very shaky, unstable environment. In actual fact, if you have a strong, trusting relationship with your God, and you believe that your times are in His hand, then you're actually on a rock. You've got the firmest foundation that you can have. It's unshakable, that rock. That's the lesson that comes out of Psalm 31. David is going hither and hither, chased all over the place, yet he's got a relationship with God that is unshakable. So did our Lord Jesus Christ supremely have such a relationship with his God. Now let's conclude this by looking at the last two verses of Psalm 31. This is 23 and 24. Now here's the appeal, the final encouragement to those who understand the lesson that this psalm taught our Lord Jesus Christ and came from the experience of David. This is the lesson that we have to get out of it, brothers and sisters. O love Yahweh, all ye his saints. Now when you think of the word saints, what do you think of? The New Testament word saint has the idea of being separate, set apart, okay? That's not what this word means. This is the Hebrew word rendered here, saints. It is the Hebrew word chesed. Kind, hence goodly. It comes from the same root as the word kesed, which is the word used by God himself in Exodus 34 verse 6 about his characteristic of loving kindness. A word that means in the Hebrew to bend over and to show kindness to an inferior. So here is the divine character that's involved in this word saints. So why would that be the case? Well, of course, it's obvious, isn't it? We're not called to the truth to be saved, brothers and sisters. Well, that's an outcome, isn't it? That's an outcome. We're not called to be saved. We're called to glorify God. Yeah. And we glorify God by developing His character through the influence of His Word, through the experiences of life, by the, you know, the hustle and bustle of life, just like we've read in Psalm 31. The disappointments, the betrayals, you know, getting up off the floor. Yeah, we learn the character of God. And if we are like that, when Christ comes, we will be in the kingdom. Because God wants people to glorify him forevermore. That's why these people are called saints. So Robberham's translation is pretty good. All ye, his men of loving kindness, men of that character. People with that disposition. Goes on to say this. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. He abundantly repays. He will abundantly repay to the good, but he will abundantly repay to the evil and to the proud who go their own way. The men like the men of Keilah will suffer because of their betrayal of David. Judas suffered because of his betrayal of Christ. You don't get away with it. Verse 24. Be of good courage. Or as the Interlinear Bible says, be strong. 
And there's a good need for that today. Be strong. And it goes on to say this. And he shall strengthen your heart, or ye that hope in Yahweh. And that word strengthen means to be alert. And Rotherham, sorry, the interlinear Bible says, he will make your heart stronger. So what that is telling us, brothers and sisters, is that if we had this pattern in our life, where though we might be in a shaky, unstable environment, like a suck-off or a booth, and we see that we, we are in fact on a rock, an immovable rock, because of our relationship with our God. If we get strength from that, you know what's going to happen? God will make our heart stronger. So we can endure more trials. He'll make your heart stronger. That's the pruning, isn't it? That's John 15. Pruned? Well, you get pruned again. Why? Why? Because it produces character, doesn't it? Produces character. And that's what God wants. He wants you and his kingdom for one reason. Because you are like him. And you'll glorify him. Just like his son did. Showed his father's character. And that's, brothers and sisters, why we've been called. Doesn't matter who upsets you or betrays you, crosses your path. Doesn't matter what unstable environment you might be in, whatever that may be, brothers and sisters. You've got this confidence, then nothing, nothing will prevent you from being there in that day. So tomorrow, God willing, we'll have a look at Psalms of glory, Psalms of suffering.